supposed to be in the third book, and we're not. Um, I started to say, you know, that this began as a trilogy, but it didn't. She, ran, she wrote this, um, I think she completed writing this in around 1959. Right? Then she spent two years trying to find a publisher. 26 rejections before she found a publisher. It was published in 1962. The next book, which I didn't bring with me, the next book I think was published in 72 or 73. Okay? Uh, the third book was not too much longer after that. It wasn't 10 years, I know that. Maybe four or five years. And then the next two books were published 10 to 15 years. I mean, so she was working on all five of them from essentially 1959 I think until about 94, 95, by the time she finished the, um, the fifth one. And she's written a whole bunch of other things as well. All that is to just to say we're way behind. Um, and I, there's no way we can do everything else that's on the syllabus. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for you. How many of you have bought the Charlie Fletcher books off Amazon? Really, only three of you. Okay. Uh, I hope you got good, did you get a good price, like real cheap, like two, three bucks? I have no idea why, well, I do, why the university cannot um, purchase books from Amazon, but they can't. So that's why I can't order those books for the class. Because I'm, I'm kind of torn um, between dropping those three books and just, you know, doing the rest of these, and I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, I think what we're going to have to do, and I hate to do this because it's so good, is we're going to have to drop Gaiman, Neil Gaiman's Everywhere. Uh, excuse me, Neverwhere, which is the exact opposite of Everywhere. Um, <laughs> I've had Gaiman on my syllabus a couple of other times. I've never actually taught it. I really, I really want to because he, he's doing some really interesting things in that um, uh, in that novel. But yeah, I think what we're going to do then is we're going to drop Neverwhere. I may come up with some kind of extra credit or something out of it um, for you if you've bought it. Um, by the way, there is an extra credit thing on D2L, okay, on the announcements part. So if you are wanting extra credit, in need of extra credit, there's another, uh, what is it, 20 point opportunity. Um, so make sure you read that. So we're going to drop Gaiman's Neverwhere and we'll spend two days on Wrinkle in Time, two days on Wind in the Door, two days on Swiftly Tilting Planet. We probably won't need two days for each of these, probably a day and a half maybe. Um, so don't, if you bought it, don't return it yet. I mean, we might if I can cover each of these in a day and a half, we might be able to squeeze out a day and a half for Gaiman. But Gaiman is a much denser writer than these or the Lloyd Alexander material. Um, both denser in the terms of number of words per page. I mean, the book is twice the thickness of this and four times the number of words on a page. I mean, it's real small print, real packed page. But he's such a good writer. Um, so the plan is uh, we'll do two days for each of these and we'll start then the Stoneheart Trilogy on November 14th and that will get us essentially caught up. If we're able to cover these more quickly then we'll pack um, then maybe we'll tack on Neil Gaiman at the end if we run uh, into having time. Okay. So for the next several days, we're doing these. Um, as I said, she began writing this in 1959. I had a question about the, the extra credit. Yes. Didn't see any, like, I saw a kind of general range of dates for them, like, whenever I clicked to look for it. Um, I didn't see any times. 730. It was 730? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and... Yeah, 9th through the 12th, I believe. Tucker Theater. It is Tucker Theater, right? It's not yeah. Batwell yet. Yeah. It's Tucker Theater. Because sometimes they do things in Batwell. Um, Tucker Theater, November 7th, uh, excuse me, November 9th to the 12th. This is MTSU's and the National Shakespeare Festival's production of 
Midsummer Night's Dream, um, which actually does tie in with this class fairly well because there are fantasy elements. And there are also two matinee performances, 10 o'clock, I think, Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. But that's going to be full of high schoolers and middle schoolers. Yes? Um, question. I'm actually going to be working costuming for Midsummer. Would I still be able to yeah. write this? Okay. Um, as I said, this was written 59. That pocket? There it is. 1959. Published in 1962. Okay. Sorry, that's not printing very well. Um, what's going on in the world in 1959 to 1962? We just had the anniversary, oh, uh, when was it? Week, two weeks ago, of something that happened in 1957, which was pretty big. Sputnik, okay, Russians launched the first satellite, which, you know, wasn't uh, necessarily good news for most Americans. We're... We're in the, in 59, we're in the heyday of the space race, okay? We're having scientific discoveries, not quite on a yearly level, but pretty much. Um, you know, it's the still relatively early in the beginning of the atomic age. Uh, in 59, it's only 10 years after Russia detonated its first nuclear weapon, so we know there are at least two. China isn't going to get one for another 10 years or so. Um, Britain, I don't remember if they have any at this point. I think France does. Uh, Germany does not. Uh, Japan does not. It still does not. Um, so you, you've got the space race going on. You've got the arms race going on. Huge arms race at this point. In 59, you still have um, open air bursts of you know, nuclear testing in the South Pacific generally, but also some still in Nevada, Area 51, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and such, uh, you know, which people can see from... A distance and feel and hear uh, and experience, you know, fallout and all that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily the um, the most peaceful time in the world, though. In the United States, you know, what is the 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 popular myth today about the 1950s? About the under the desk thing. Well, I mean, that comes a little bit later. Yeah, where you have, you know. Um, your duck and cover drills, which I remember doing, you know, air raid warning goes off, and put your hand over your head and climb under a disc, not much different than these, so that if a bomb goes off, you'll somehow save yourself. Um, now, I mean, kind of culturally, socially in the United States. I have the nuclear family. Well, you do have the so-called nuclear family, you know, husband, wife, two kids, car in every garage. I mean, what's going on consumeristly oh. in, in the United States? It, Everybody's buying houses. It's in this period you get the American, dream. the American dream, okay? Air conditioners, TVs, radio's been around for a while, okay? Before really color TV, though there are some, all right? Um, you know, the American economy is zooming on along. People are making lots of money. People are spending lots of money. It's the proverbial great period of the middle class. Okay? Suburbs are going up all over the place. One reason is because tax money is flowing in. Government is building roads. Eisenhower began just about five years before this. Might be a little bit later than that. Might have been 56. The, uh, the highway system. Interstate 40, Interstate 80, Interstate 5, all those roads, okay? Anybody know why Eisenhower said we needed the interstate system? In case of war. Yeah. 
It was because of his experience in World War II in Germany. Germany had these nice, big, wide roads, made it really easy to move war material. Okay? The United States had state roads, like Broad Street, okay? Memorial Boulevard. 231, that, that's all it had prior to Eisenhower doing these roads. So you've got that. You've also got, you know, medical breakthrough, breakthroughs. Jonas Salk and the polio vaccine, I think in 59. Um, Linus Pauling and his discoveries about vitamin C, I think, was in the late 50s and such. Okay? X-rays have been around for a while. Penicillin's been around for quite a while. So you've got, you know, all these kinds of great scientific breakthroughs. But there's still an awful lot to be, to be done. So she's writing this in the midst of that. Now, who's the protagonist? The protagonist, classically speaking, protagonist literally means the greatest sufferer, the, the greatest agent, if you want. Who's the protagonist of this novel? Is it Charles Wallace? No. No. Who is it? May. This is about Meg, okay? Primarily. How old is Meg? Uh, 14. Not 14. Calvin's 14. 14. Oh. And Calvin is a couple of years ahead of her. 13. Is she 12? She's 12, okay? Or thereabouts. We know she's a couple of years ahead of Calvin. Calvin's a junior, so if he's a couple of years ahead of her. And she's only 12, and she's a 12-year-old freshman in high school. I mean, she's, you know, she's got some brains on her, okay? We already know Calvin is smart because, I mean, he, we're even told he's up a few years more than he should be. We're told Meg is smart. What do her parents do? They're scientists. They're scientists. Mom is a molecular biologist and some other kind of biologist, and her father is a physicist, so they're both brainiacs, okay? Who else is in the family? There's the twins. Twins, Sandy and Dennis, and Charles Wallace, the younger brother. Dennis. Pardon? I thought it was pronounced Dennis. Yeah, it's Dennis, oh. okay? So the novel begins with the quintessential bad beginning of a novel. It was a dark and stormy night. You're not supposed to begin a story that way. Okay, um, but she does. Okay, why? She kind of wants to catch us off guard because you you pick up a book and read it and you're going like, oh man, really? This isn't going to be any good, and it may not be to you. I mean, you may finish this and think, man, this is horrible. So we meet Meg in her bedroom at night, and fairly early on. School. School was all wrong. She had been dropped down to the lowest section in her grade, and one of her teachers had said, what about her? It's difficult to understand how a child with parents as brilliant as yours are supposed to be, are supposed to be, can be such a poor student. In other words, if your parents are such geniuses, how are you such a moron? You know, teachers aren't supposed to speak like that <laughs> today, <laughs> or even then. If you don't manage to do a little better, you'll have to stay back next year. Okay. Then one of the girls says something to her at lunch. And Meg lies there in bed and thinks, why can't I hide it too? Page nine, Meg thought. Why do I always have to show everything? What does she mean about showing everything? That she's as easy to read as like a book. Okay. She's a schoolmate. She's what? She's a schoolmate. Okay. She doesn't hide anything. She doesn't hide her emotions. Right? Other kids are asleep. She's wondering how they can sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she's going back and thinking through the day, page 11. She's going to go downstairs and get something to eat. And notice, as she leaves her room, she's just bumping into stuff. Okay? This is kind of a metaphor for Meg's life. She's always bumping into things. She bumps against the ping pong table. Then she walks into her old doll's house. Then she walks into Charles Wallace's rocking horse. And then the twins, electric trains. Why must everything happen to me, she asks. Okay. 
So she gets down to the kitchen, and who does she discover already there? Charles. Seemingly waiting for her. Charles Wallace. Okay. He tells her, I've been waiting for you. She's like, why didn't you come upstairs? He said, no, it's too loud, too noisy, the wind of the storm. Page 13. He says, I knew you'd be down. I put some milk on the stove for you. How old is Charles Wallace? Five. So she's about 12. The twins, Sandy and Dennis, are 10. Charles Wallace is about five. Okay. He'll be at school next year. So this would be like the age of kindergarten, back when kindergarten wasn't mandatory. Okay. How, did, how could he always tell? He never knew or seemed to care about Sandy, Dennis or Sandy. Okay. And she's thinking about what people have said about the Murray family. Middle of page 13. The two boys seem to be nice, regular children, but that unattractive girl and the baby boy certainly aren't all there. Unattractive girl. Man, there's a mark against her right off the bat, right? She's ugly. Girls aren't supposed to be ugly, okay? And she thinks about a conversation with her father when she told him that she doesn't want Charles Wallace to grow up dumb like me, top of page 14. He says, oh, my darling, you're not dumb. You're like Charles Wallace. Your development has to go at its own pace. It just doesn't <laughs> happen to be the usual pace. So what does that mean? She's a late bloomer. Late bloomer, you know, today, not as opposed to 50 years ago, which is almost when this is. Uh, it's over 50 years ago, sorry. Today, you know, if a child isn't walking by a certain age, pediatricians, man, they start getting all jittery and start talking to their parents about, you know, there's something wrong. Or if a child doesn't start talking by a certain age, oh, got to go take them to a speech pathologist, make, make sure there's... What do Mr. and Mrs. Murray say about their children? Oh, they're just getting along at their own time. Okay. They're going to let them grow at their own pace. So, Meg, how do you know? I mean, you're just saying that because you love me. He says, well, I do love you, but, you know, we've been giving you tests. Games they've been playing. IQ tests. Is my IQ Okay. More than okay. Okay, so what does that mean? Is my IQ okay? The average okay range is something like 110, might be 105, to about 120. If it's like 100 to 120, that's okay. You start going lower than 100, eh, a little suboptimal. Start going over 120, and you start getting into the bright, you know, advanced, you get up to the 160 genius, I think the top is 180, and there have only been, I don't know, a dozen or so people who have ever maxed out that. Einstein, one of them, is one of them, et cetera. Okay? So, she's more than okay. He says, you just need to grow into it. What? How do you grow into your brain, you know? So, Mrs. Murray comes down. And they start to have a talk. And we hear May kind of talking about how her day's been and such. And Mrs. Murray says, page 17. I'm sure I don't skip something. We get a description of Meg again and then Mrs. Murray, bottom of 16. Flaming red hair, creamy skin, violet eyes, long dark lashes. She's gorgeous. And then there's Meg. Okay? And Mrs. Murray says, you don't know the meaning of moderation, do you, my darling? A happy medium is something I wonder if you'll ever learn. What does she mean? Not swinging back and forth between the, the two extremes of the pendulum. Okay? A happy medium. Okay. Why does she have the bruise on her face? She got into a fight with someone who called Charles Wallace stuff. She beat up a bigger kid. Okay. 
who Mrs. Murray had been on the phone with earlier. Meg says at the bottom, it's been an awful week. I'm full of bad feeling. Mrs. Murray, do you know why? That is, why are you full of bad feeling? Why has it been an awful week? I hate being an oddball. It's hard on Sandy and Dennis too. I don't know if they're really like everybody else or if they're just able to pretend they are. I try to pretend, but it isn't any help. Notice what Meg is saying here. Mrs. Murray, you're much too straightforward to be able to pretend to be what you aren't. To pretend to be what you aren't means what? To pretend to be what? Someone else. Someone else? Or something else. What does Meg feel like she needs to pretend to be? It's not someone else. It's close to that. Or a normal kid? <clears throat> Yes, like everybody else. She doesn't fit in. Charles Wallace doesn't fit in, right? Mm -hmm. What does everybody think about him? One, that he's dumb, because he never talks when he's around other people. Five-year-olds should talk. Okay? And when he does talk, you're going to see in the next book, he goes to school. He's in first grade. And he's asked by the teacher, who's a brain-dead idiot, okay, based on what the teacher asked the students. The teacher asked the students, you know, something about, well, what have you been doing today? Or how was your week or something? And he starts talking about mitochondria in the cells. He's six years old. And the teacher thinks he's made up a word, mitochondria, because the teacher doesn't know what mitochondria are. Why? Because this teacher's stupid. Well, no. Because in the context of the novel, mitochondria have not actually been studied that much. And what an interesting question is to ask. Okay, she's writing this from 1959. It gets published in 1962. When is it set? Is it set in this time period? Because in the next book, we're going to hear, you know, we've sent men to Mars. Well, we haven't sent men to Mars. We stopped, foolishly, I would say, sending men to the moon in, what, 1977? Earlier than that, 75, I think. Okay. And only now are various nations beginning to talk about sending people back to the moon, etc. Okay. So... Charles Wallace mentions Mrs. What's-It, and Meg and Mrs. Murray don't know who he's talking about. Um, to hear a noise outside, Mrs. Murray goes to find out what the noise is, and it's Mrs. What's-It. Page 24 and 25. We still don't know who Mrs. What's-It is, other than that she's dressed in a whole bunch of clothes and looks like a bag lady, essentially. You know, kind of lady you see pushing a grocery cart down the street with all of her belongings in it, bags hanging off the side. Page 24. She tells Charles Wallace, tell your sister I'm all right. Tell her my intentions are good. Charles Wallace, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This is a five-year-old. <laughs> my, but isn't he cunning, Mrs. Whatsit says. It's lucky he has someone to understand him. I'm afraid he doesn't, Mrs. Murray said. None of us is quite up to Charles. In other words, me, with my double PhD, I don't quite understand him. But at least you aren't trying to squash him down. What does she mean? You're not trying to squash him down. They're not trying to mold him into like what a five-year-old should be. They're just letting him be himself. You're letting him be himself. You're not trying to make him like... Every other five-year-old. You're letting him be himself. I don't know if they had it when you guys were in grade school, because it's been a while, but when my kids were, yeah, in fact, take that back, they did, because my daughter's older than some of you, they had it then. You know, the accelerated reading lists, we kept getting in trouble, because none of my kids wanted to read the books that were within the quote-unquote age range. 
or number range. Oh, no, no. Katie can't read that. That's at 7.1. Yeah, but she's reading at a ninth grade level, you know, in third grade. So why can't she read that? Well, because it's not appropriate. Tell me what's appropriate, you know, for my child. That's what Mrs. Murray is essentially doing her with her children. She's letting them kind of go at their own pace. So they keep talking. Mrs. Watson gets comfortable. She gets her boots off. She's drying her feet out and stuff. And just before she leaves, page 27, she says, speaking of ways, pet, by the way, there is such a thing as a tesseract. Mrs. Murray goes white. What did you say? I said there is such a thing as a tesseract. And she leaves. Okay. We don't know what a tesseract is. I could be wrong here. Probably am, but I don't think I am. But I don't think there was such a thing as a tesseract when Madelina wrote this. She, I think, I could be, I think I'm right. She created the word that is now regularly used in astrophysics. Okay. She had been reading, she says in some interviews, she'd been reading a bunch of physics articles and such as part of the basis for writing this. So Meg, the next morning, asks her mother, what's a tesseract? The concept, I'll talk about it later. Okay. She says, you need to go off to school, and we'll talk about it later. Sandy and Dennis come out, come down, and they tell her and Charles, essentially, that you guys just need to kind of get along. Meg, I know, we're morons. Top of page 30. I wish you wouldn't be such a dope, Meg, Sandy says. You don't have to take everything so personally. Use a happy medium. For heaven's sake, you just goof around in school and look out the window. Don't pay any attention. In other words, you'd do well in school if you did what? Patience. Why doesn't she pay attention? She's too worried about herself. Is that it? Is she worried about herself? Or is it more the case, as often happens, with really bright students, what? Teachers don't understand them, or the student is bored. Einstein flunked math. Okay, just let that sink in for a bit. For those of us who flunked or nearly flunked math, yay, Einstein, you know. <laughs> Doesn't mean there's any hope for me, but, you know, yay, Einstein. She's bored, okay. Dennis, you just make things harder for yourself. Charles Wallace is going to have an awful time next year when he starts school. Why? We know he's bright, but he's so funny when he's around other people. They're so used to thinking he's dumb. I don't know what's going to happen to him. Notice, what does he mean? We know he's bright, but he's so funny when he's around other people. Does that mean he's, you know, he's around other people and he turns into Robin Williams? He's just, you know, funny how? Awkward. Awkward. He's an oddball, okay? What do people not like? Different things. Difference. Yeah. I always use this analogy in one of my classes, or this image in one of my classes. My first or second year teaching here, this was 94, 95 maybe. I was walking back from KUC, checking my mail, and class had just gotten out, and so there's a mass of students heading um, from KUC towards Peck Hall. I mean, like 100, 150, and this is before they widen the sidewalk like it is now, so it was a fair, fairly narrow sidewalk like this right here. And they're all going this way, and there's this guy coming from the area of Peck Hall towards KUC. And I'm not, I'm not kidding with how I'm describing what, how he is dressed and everything, okay? He's dressed with, like with a white ballerina tutu. On. High top, black converse, uh, sparkly stuff in his hair, and he's got a couple of um, paper clips, 
like one hanging from a lip and one hanging, I think, from his eyebrow. And he's just kind of literally skipping on down the middle of the sidewalk. And I'm not kidding. It's like Moses standing at the Red Sea. That <laughs> mass of people just kind of goes. <laughs> you know, and he just skips along. And everybody's walking by like this. And it's like everybody just kind of backs up like maybe it's catching. <laughs> right? Marches to the tune of his own drummer, so to speak. That's kind of what Charles Wallace is. Meg wants to be able to get along, wants to be able to go with the flow. Yet she just doesn't seem to be able to pull it off. So what happens? She's at school. In social studies, she was asked to name the principal imports and exports of Nicaragua. And though she looked them up dutifully the evening before, now she could remember none of them. Okay. And I was thinking about this yesterday. I asked my wife something because I, I actually I was thinking it was in the next book, but it is in this one. Why would, would Madeline Lingle throw in the imports and exports of Nicaragua? Who gives a flying fig for the imports and exports of Nicaragua? even in a social studies class. Okay. People from Nicaragua? Yeah, I mean, if you're in Nicaragua, that could be pretty important because that you know, says something about your economy, whether or not you have a job. I think she includes this for one reason, and it's that this is a nod to C.S. Lewis. Have any of you read The Chronicle of Narnia? I've read a few of the books. Okay. In, in the second book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, we meet a character named Eustace Scrubs, or Scrub, okay? And we're told at the beginning of that novel, Eustace comes from a very progressive family. Lewis actually uses the term progressive. His parents are very concerned with, you know, social justice, all that kind of stuff. And he's read all the wrong kinds of books. And he can tell you about the imports and exports of Nicaragua. Okay. The problem with Eustace is he hasn't read the right kinds of books. The books that ennoble you. That is, the books that make you a noble person. The books that build up a sense of honor and integrity and all this kind of stuff. And he's a real, for lack of a better word, prick. <laughs> Throughout most of the novel. Until he becomes what's called undragon because he turns into a dragon in the course of the novel and then he has to be turned back into a little boy essentially I highly recommend it anyways I think that she's kind of throwing a, a nod towards Lewis there so she mutters to himself to herself who cares about the imports and exports of Nicaragua and the teacher if you're going to be rude Margaret you may leave the room <laughs> okay fine you know I wish my teachers had said that. So she gets sent to Mr. Jenkins' office, the principal's. And he says, don't you realize that you just make everything harder for yourself by your attitude? Now, what does he mean by your attitude? He does he mean she has attitude, that kind of attitude? She's stubborn and uncooperative. Okay. Okay. See, it could be all three of those. Or maybe it's because he believes that she's trying to be different on purpose and trying to be a problem child. Okay. Have any of you ever seen Spam a Lot or heard of it? It's I've heard of it. Monty Python, so you can go from there. Well, they have a song in there called. Just look on the bright side of life. Google it. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay, just Google it and, and watch it. Okay, because it's look on the bright side of life when life is falling completely to hell around you. You know, your spouse gets killed, your son dies, your dog is murdered, it's, or your 
son is murdered, your dog dies. <laughs> Got to get those two verbs right. I mean, dogs are more important. You know. so. so just look on the bright side of life when all those things happen. Okay. In other words, attitude changes things. So he says, I'm convinced you can do the work and keep up with your grade if you will apply yourself. But some of your teachers aren't. What's Mr. Jenkins saying here? That everybody thinks you're stupid. No. If everybody includes him. He's saying, you can do this. What's he trying to do to her? He's encouraging her. He's just saying, if you would just shift your attitude a little bit. What's the number one problem? Or what's the hardest thing about writing a paper? Which you've all got to do for me. And probably some other classes. Actually doing it. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because you just, you got your thoughts in your head, but you just don't want to take the time to write it all down. Okay. You don't want to take the time to write it all down. In other words, story, you don't want to do it. It's that attitude. I don't want to do this. And it's going to be hard. And I'm not going to get a good grade. Blah, 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 blah. So what do you do? You wait. <laughs> and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Okay? Took me a long time to learn the lesson about how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you write a paper? One step at a time. And one of the things that always helped me was looking at the end of the process. By this time, tomorrow. By this time, two days from now. And by this time, a week from now, the paper will be done. Of course, that still means between now and then, you got to sit down and do the dunning, okay? So, Meg, I don't know what to do. Well, you know, you could do your homework. How's that about for a beginning? Do your homework, Meg. Learn about the exports and imports of Nicaragua. Because what can you do after you've learned it and spat it out on a test? What? Gone. Forever. Ask me geometry, you know, theorems and such. I don't remember them, other than Pythagoraism. That's about the only one. Okay? So, school doesn't go that well for her. She comes home, and Charles Wallace says, we need to go see Mrs. What's It, page 34 and 35. They go off to find her in pages 36 and following. Charles tells her, when she says, I got sent to Mr. Jen Mr. Jenkins, he made snide remarks about father. I know. How do you know? You tell me. <laughs> but I don't tell you and you know. Everything about you tells me. But what about the twins? They don't tell you, do you? He says, no, I, I could know if I wanted to. But I just concentrate on you and mother. You mean you read our minds? No. It's being able to understand a sort of language. Like sometimes if I concentrate very hard, I can understand the wind talking with the trees. What? What does he mean he understands the wind talking with the trees? He says, you know, it's, it's inadvertent. Mother looked that up for me. I really must learn to read, except I'm afraid it will make it awful hard for me in school next year if I already know things. Well, he already knows things. So they keep going on, and they meet up, and there's another kid there. As their big black dog Fortinbras, or Fortinbras, kind of corners the kid. Charles Wallace. Who is he? Meg, Calvin O'Keefe. He's in regional. He's older than I am. He's a big bug. I have no idea what she means by big bug. Like Jock? A big man on campus. Yeah, I think it's probably that because he's on the basketball team. Okay? So, they get Fort to back off a little bit. And Charles Wallace, as, you know, Fort still hasn't kind of cornered, says, tell me about him, Meg. Well, I don't want to know anything about him. He's a couple of grades above me. He's on the basketball team. We're going to hear he's a junior, so that means it's got to mean she's a freshman. He says he's only on the basketball team because he's tall. Okay. Tall he certainly was, skinny. Bony wrists stuck out of the sleeves of his blue sweater. Okay. 
His wrists stick out, meaning his sweater is like this. Okay? What else? His worn corduroy trousers were three inches too short. What's that tell us? The clothes are too small. Now, it could be because he's going through a growth spurt. He's growing really fast. What else could it mean? He's poor. He's poor. Family can't afford clothes. Okay. Charles Wallace, tell us what you're doing here. This is a five-year-old to a 14-year-old. What is this? Aren't you the one who's supposed to be a moron? Notice Calvin doesn't hold anything back. Okay. Says, that's right. If you want me to call my dog off, you'd better give. That is, answer me. Most peculiar moron I've ever met. I came to get away from my family. What kind of family? Notice, not what family, what kind of family. Third from the top of 11 kids. 11 kids. I'm a sport. Charles, so am I. I don't mean like in baseball. Neither do I. So Charles understands what Calvin's talking about. Calvin, I mean like in biology. Charles, a change in gene resulting in the appearance in the offspring of a character, which is not present in the parents, but which is potentially transmissible to its offspring. How does he know that if he can't read yet? His mom probably His mom him. reads to him. And she reads to him a biology textbook. One evening, I think this night, he's going to go to bed, and Calvin's going to read to him from the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. a five-year-old. Whatever happened to, you know, Humpty Dumpty and things like that, okay? <laughs> Calvin, what gives? I was told you couldn't talk, and he's just talked like a scientist. Thinking I'm a moron gives people something to feel smug about. Why should I disillusion them? That is... Why should I make them not feel smug? What would happen if everybody heard Charles Wallace talking like this? They'd be careful around him. Okay, what else? They put him in high school at six years old. Okay, what else? They probably do experiments. Do average intelligent people, like really intelligent people to be around them? No. no. Have any of you ever read Fahrenheit 451? If you haven't, Read it, okay? Because it is so appropriate for what is going on in college campuses today. But in there, Ray Bradbury talks about ideas and people with brains and says, you know, none of us really like the people with brains in grade school because what often happens to them? They get beat up. Why? Because they make everybody else look bad. That's what he means by letting others feel smug. How old are you, Cal? 14? What grade? Notice, Cal doesn't call him Calvin, Junior, 11th. I'm bright. Yeah, no kidding, you're bright. 14 and a junior? So he's going to graduate at 15? Anybody ask you, ask you to come here this afternoon? What do you mean, asked? <laughs> like, hello? What does ask usually mean? Still don't trust me, do you? I don't distrust you. Calvin, come on. You're holding out on me. So are you. I get a feeling about things. Compulsion. You know what compulsion means? And he rattles off the dictionary definition. He says, well, when I get this compulsion, I always do what it tells me. I can't explain where it comes from. I just do it. Okay? He said, and this compulsion told me I need to be here. Charles Wallace, okay. I believe you. You should come with us and have dinner. Oh, don't worry about mom. She'll be fine. Okay. So, Kel asks, what about Meg? Okay, where is Meg during this whole conversation? Right there. Standing right there, like she's not there. Calvin asks, what about your mother? Oh, she'd be delighted. Mother's all right. She's not one of us, but she's all right. What about Meg? Meg has it tough. She's not really one thing or the other. That is, she's not one of us, but she's not also like Sandy and Dennis. Meg, what do you mean one of us? What do you mean I'm not one thing or the other? Not now, Meg. <laughs> Five-year-old smacks, you know. What do you mean not now? So what does he mean, one of us? 
what is Cal, what is, sorry, what is Charles Wallace doing when he actually says he knows what Meg is thinking or what his mother is thinking? Oh, I can't ask that question. I'm reading this one and the next one at the same time, and something's brought in the next one that explains that. Okay, never mind. Um, so they go home. Actually, they don't go home. They go off to the hut, and they meet Mrs. Who. We've already met Mrs. What's It. Now we get Mrs. Who. And how does Mrs. Who usually communicate? Through quotes. Through quotations. Okay? Usually foreign ones. So she says, page 42, my French is really old. Le cœur se ressent que le ressent ne connaît point. French, Pascal, the heart has its reasons whereof reason knows nothing. Okay? What that means is the heart doesn't act according to reason or logic. And reason, rationality and logic, can't understand the motions, the promptings, the movings of the heart and such. Okay? So then she quotes Seneca and Mrs. What's it? Um, let's see here. Let's skip that. The end of the chapter. They go off to, to um, the Murray house, and Calvin says, Lead on, moron. I've never even seen your house, and I have the funniest feeling that for the first time in my life, I'm going home. What does he mean? He has a home. But he doesn't feel like he belongs there. He has his own family, yeah, but he doesn't feel like he belongs there. Because he's a sport. So. What does a sport mean exactly? Remember what they quoted? A change in gene resulting in the appearance in the offspring of a character which is not present in the parents, but which is potentially transmissible to its offspring. For example... Two brown-eyed parents having a blue-eyed child. It can't happen. Okay? It's not what you expect to happen. Okay? Here, it's a different kind of gene. <laughs> so, chapter 3. They make their way back. Calvin, walking with Meg, his fingers barely touching her arm in a protective gesture, Nowadays, that would probably be read as Calvin is some creeper, you know, trying to get his hands on her. And Meg thinking, this is the most impossible, most confusing afternoon of my life. Yet I don't feel confused or upset anymore. I feel happy. Why? Yeah, because Calvin's walking with his hand nearly on her arm. Calvin, maybe we weren't meant to meet before this. I mean, I knew who you were in school and everything. But I didn't know you. But I'm glad we've met now, Meg. We're going to be friends, you know. Kind of awkward, but okay. And she is glad. So they get to their house, and Calvin says, you know, I better call my mom. So he asks for the phone. Meg shows him where it is. And he says, bottom of 46, top of 47. I don't know why I call her when I don't come home. His voice bitter. She wouldn't notice. Yeah, with 11 kids, of course she wouldn't notice. He dials, Ma, oh, Hinky, tell Ma I won't be home till late. No, now don't forget, I don't want to be locked out again. He looks at Meg, you know how lucky you are? Not most of the time. Why not most of the time? Because she has her own problems. Because she's focused on her own problems, okay? What does Calvin mean? A mother like that, that is drop dead gorgeous and brains, a house like this, what does he mean by a house like this? A house is a house, right? Probably Four walls, jobs. roof, hopefully. <laughs> what else characterizes this house? Just more homely. Meaning? A family. A family, meaning? What permeates this house? Love. Even when Sandy and Dennis are picking on Charles Wallace or Meg, calling them names and stuff, it's playful banter. Okay? You should see my mother. 
But he's talking about physical outward things. You should see my mother. She had all her upper teeth out. So no upper teeth. Pop got her a plate, but she won't wear it. That is, a plate with false teeth. But she won't wear it. Most days, she doesn't even comb her hair. So, describe Calvin O'Keefe's mother. She's given up. She doesn't even care what she looks like. Why bother? Yeah, she doesn't leave the house. Not that it makes much difference when she does. That is, when she does comb her hair or brush her hair. But I love her. That is, notwithstanding that, I love her. That's the funny part of it. I love them all, and they don't give a hoot about me. Maybe that's why I call when I'm not going to be home. Because I care. Nobody else does. You don't know how lucky you are to be loved. Meg said in a startled way, I guess I never thought of that. I guess I just took it for granted. So notice two home lives that we have described here. One, where Meg, Charles Wallace, Dennis, Sandy are loved and love builds them up, lifts them up, everything. Four kids, O'Keefe house, 11 kids. Mom doesn't know whether they're home or not or night and seemingly doesn't care, okay, and seemingly no love. And Meg says, I just took it for granted. Calvin looked somber, then smiles. Things are going to happen, Meg. Good things. I feel it. Okay. He sees a picture of Meg's father and a bunch of scientists. And he says, you know, he's not handsome or anything, but I like him. Page 48. Meg, he is too handsome. Nah, tall and skinny like me. Well, I think you're handsome. Nice little, you know. His eyes are kind of like yours too, you know, really blue. And then they start talking about homework. What does Calvin excel at? And what does Meg excel at? Meg's better at math. Meg's good with numbers. Calvin's good with words. So Meg's mom says, well, why don't you let Meg help you with your homework? He's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm several grades ahead of her. In other words, no, nah, it'll be too hard for her. And she sits down with a pencil and paper and explains a way of doing something. And he's like, whoa, <laughs> that's totally cool. And everything I could go on rant about, you know, modern public education, but I won't. Page 50. Mrs. Murray says, the trouble with Meg and math is that Meg and her father used to play with numbers and Meg learned far too many shortcuts. I used to do this a little bit with some of my kids, you know, multiplying multiple digits. I'd figure out shortcuts so that I wouldn't be able to do it on a piece of paper, but I could do it up here. And they're like, how did you do that? Because I could multiply things faster than they could punch it in a calculator. But I'm not good with numbers. Okay? So he asks Meg, what's a megaparsec? Oh, it's a nickname father uses for me. It's also 3.26 million light years. And so he starts quizzing her. What's E equals MC squared? Einstein's equation. What's E stand for? Energy, M, mass, C, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So then he asks her some questions. What's capital of New York? Well, New York City, of course. Right or wrong? Wrong. Man, it's Albany. Okay. Who wrote Boswell's Life of Johnson? Oh, Calvin, I'm not any good at English. Boswell's Life of Johnson. <laughs> okay. And he turns to Mrs. Murray. I, I, I see what you mean. Her, I wouldn't want to teach. Okay. So Calvin says, top of 52, he feels like he's just being born. Why? I'm not alone anymore. What has Meg felt? Alone. That she's alone. But you're good at basketball and things. In other words, Daniel said, you're big man on campus. Everybody likes you. 
for all the most unimportant reasons. There hasn't been anybody, anybody in the world I can talk to. In other words, yeah, I'm a jock, but that's unimportant. It's what's going on up here, he says. Meg, I'm all confused. <laughs> Charles, uh, Calvin, so am I. But now we're going somewhere that at least, he's saying, we're confused together. At least we can talk to each other. Okay. So they talk to Mrs. Murray. And Mrs. Murray explains that she thinks that the strange things that are happening have something to do with Meg's father. Where is Meg's father? They don't miss him. Missing for how long? Uh, years. A year. We didn't really know Charles Wall, so it's been a while. It's been like four years. It's been like four years. Okay. Charles Wallace was just a baby when he left. He was already speaking with them, but so Mrs. Murray says, I think it's got to have something to do. Do you, th always, do you think things always have an explanation? Bottom of 53. I believe they do. But I think that with our human limitations, we're not always able to understand the explanations. You see, Meg, just because we don't understand doesn't mean that the explanation doesn't exist. Meg, I like to understand things. In other words, I want to understand. I want to know not only why, but how. That's going to become a problem for her in the next book. Okay. So she says, Charles Wallace understands more than the rest of us, doesn't he? Meg does. Mrs. Murray, yes. Why? She hears that why? Uh, he's different. How? What's she trying to do? Give me the answers. She wants to understand. Uh, not quite sure. You know yourself, he's not like anybody else. Think of that, state, of that statement. He's not like anybody else. Do you know anybody who is like anybody else? No. That's the wonder. That's the beauty. Everybody is unique. Everybody is individual. Meg, no, I wouldn't want him to be. It doesn't have anything to do with wanting. May, Mrs. Murray says, the bottom of 54, people are more than just the way they look. Charles Wallace's difference isn't physical. It's in essence. Well, I know he's different. I mean, I know he's something more. I guess I'll just have to accept it without understanding it. Bingo. <laughs> That's what she was trying to get across. See, this is a lesson Meg's going to have to learn again later on in this book. Mrs. Murray says... Maybe that's why I'm able to have a, a, a willing suspension of disbelief because of Charles Wallace. That is, that's why the visitor last night didn't surprise her, Mrs. Wetzel. You know, is that really a name? No. no. Right? May, are you like Charles? <laughs> no. Nothing about me that breaks out of the ordinary mold. Really? Double PhD? I mean, one's bad enough. Meg, your looks do. She goes, no, Meg, you just haven't had enough basis for comparison. Where do they live? A small town in the northeast. Okay. Calvin and Meg go to regional. What does that mean? It's the regional high school. They don't have more than one. Okay. This is a small town that they go to or that they live in. And yeah, Mrs. Murray is gorgeous. But if, the, you know, Meg were to suddenly leave this small town and move to Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Miami, Nashville, what would happen? There'd be a whole mess of gorgeous women around. Go, oh, yeah, Mom's kind of plain Jane, I guess. Okay? She's not used to seeing a great number of beautiful women. So Calvin comes back in. She asks, what did you read? Genesis. Bottom of 55. Meg says, Mother, Charles says I'm not one thing or the other. Calvin, oh, for crying out loud, Meg. You're you, aren't you? Come on, let's go for a walk. What does he mean? 
You're not Charles Wallace. You're not me. You're not your mother. You're you. What does Meg want to be? Yeah. Not her. She wants to be somebody else. Why? Because she thinks it'll be better than who she is right now. She doesn't like herself. What do you make of Calvin? She asks her mother. What does she mean? She means, what do you think of Calvin? Mrs. Murray takes that verb make, however, and takes it literally. I don't want to make anything of Calvin. Why? Perfect the way he is. Kind of creepy if you want to go there, but I don't think so. So, Meg and Calvin go off for a walk. Calvin takes her hand. They walk off into the grass. 57. He says, tell me about your dad. He's a physicist. Yeah, we all know that. He's supposed to have left your mother, gone off with some dame. She jerks up. She's all bent out of shape. He says, calm down. You've heard that before. Let me go. Calm, calm down. You know it isn't true. I know it isn't true. How anybody after one look at your mother could believe any man would leave her for another woman just shows how far jealousy will make people go, right? In other words, anyone who would look at your mother and say, your father left her for somebody else, no way. Ain't going to happen. Calvin, look, dope. I just want to get things straight. Your father's a physicist, right? Yes. Okay. Sometimes he works at Princeton. Sometimes he's in L.A. Sometimes he's in Washington. So they talk quite a bit. He brings out of her, do you think maybe your father's dead? I don't think so. I think we would have been told. Page 60. Do you think maybe they don't know where your father is? She says, that's what I'm afraid of. Why don't you cry, he says. Let it out. She says, I cry too much. I should be like mother. I should be able to control myself. Notice again what she's saying. I should be what? Someone else. Somebody else. Your mother's a completely different person. And <laughs> she's older than you are. I wish I were a different person. I hate myself. How old is she? Twelve. Well, a lot of twelve-year-olds are emotionally immature, right? Mm -hmm. They're going through a pretty... Horrible period of life. Okay. Calvin reaches over, takes her glasses off, pulls a handkerchief out, wipes her tears away, says, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry, when she just sobs away. And he says, you know, and she says, I'm sorry, now you'll hate me. He says, you know, May, you're a moron. You're the nicest thing that's happened to me in a long time. She still has her glasses off when she raises her head and looks at him. Moonlight flashes across her braces as she spoke. Do you know this is the first time I've seen you without your glasses? Calvin says. I'm blind as a bat without them. I'm nearsighted like father. Blind as a bat without them tells us what about her glasses? They're thick. And he says, well, you know... You've got dreamboat eyes. In other words, man, you've got beautiful eyes. You go right on wearing your glasses. I don't want anybody else to see what gorgeous eyes you have. And she blushes. Why? How does she think of herself? Ugly. Ugly duckling. Meanwhile, Swan, you know, back at home, working with the Bunsen burners and everything. And Calvin has just said what? That she has beautiful eyes. Damn, you're cute. <laughs> Even with her funny cut hair. And her hair is described as being cut kind of odd. Like maybe Sandy and Dennis each went at it from a different side. You know, new avant-garde hair thing. Okay. Charles Wallace shows up and said, we have to go. Go where? Find father. Okay. They make their way over. They see Mrs. What's it? Mrs. Who? And... Chapter 4, we get the black thing. Okay. They go somewhere, but they're not quite sure, sure where. And they're not quite sure how, but it's painful. Meg asks, page 67, 
Where am I? There's a silver glint. And to hear Mrs. Who's voice, let's see here, where do I want to pick up? They do find out they're after Mr. Murray. Bottom of 69. Calvin says, um, Mrs. Watson, let me take that back. Page 69, middle of the page. Mrs. Watson says, it's going to be hard for Maddie. It's going to be hard for her to realize that we are serious. Calvin, what about me? The life of your father isn't at stake. Well, what about Charles Wallace? Then? Charles Wallace knows. Charles Wallace knows that it's far more than just the life of his father. Charles Wallace knows what's at stake. And Mrs. Who then quotes Euripides, ancient Greek playwright. Nothing is hopeless. We must hope for everything. Okay. Um... I'm going to skip a bunch and go up to go to the Tesseract, the next chapter. They explain what a Tesseract is. Okay. And we get the explanation. Bottom of 85, top well, 85 through the next couple of pages. Um, which I'm not going to go through. But they're just using, they're, they're using these geometrical images to explain the fifth dimension and such. Skip a bunch again. Go to how much of that? See, there's a lot I usually skip in this. Yeah, go to chapter. I think it's still in there. The chapter of the happy medium. It wasn't an accident, by the way. Earlier, when both Mrs. Murray and Sandy and Dennis told Meg, you know, that she needed to reach the happy medium, the the point between two extremes. So, in this chapter, they leave where they were, and the medium takes them off to uh, Kamazot. We're told, bottom of 109, the medium asks, where are you going in case I want to tune in? Mrs. What's it says, Kamazot's. Meg doesn't know where or what that is or what it means. And they go to Kamazots, page 110. And on 111, Charles Wallace asks, is this Kamazots? Mrs. Watson says yes. So let's stand, catch our breath, look around. You're standing on a hill. Looks like a normal earth hill. Trees, birches, pines, maples. Okay. She could see smoke tax, smokestacks of a town. And then Mrs. What's It says, I can't stay with you here, you know. You three will be on your own. We'll be near. We'll be watching. But you won't be able to see us, nor can you ask us for help. And we will not be able to come help you. But Father's here. Yes. Where? Where will we, when will we see him? Can't tell you. Gotta wait. Charles Wallace, are you afraid for us? In other words, do you think something bad might happen to us? No. But if you weren't afraid to do what you did when you were a star, why would you? Why should you be afraid for us now, Mrs. Watson? But I was afraid. You will need help, but all I am allowed to give you is a little talisman. Okay? Talisman, like a good luck charm. Something that will protect them. Calvin, your great gift is your ability to communicate. To communicate with all kinds of people. 
So I'm going to, she says, strengthen this gift. Meg, I give you your faults. She's like, great, thanks. You know, those are already, I have those. I'm always trying to get rid of my faults, Mrs. Watson. Yes, however, I think you'll find they'll come in very handy on Camazons. Well, what are some of Meg's faults? She's stubborn. She's stubborn. She doesn't listen well. Needs her own way. Okay. Charles Wallace. He gives or he receives the resilience of his childhood. And then Mrs. Who tells Calvin something. A hint for you. A little hint. For that she was a spirit too delicate to act their earthly and abhorred commands, refusing their grand hess, they did confine him by help of their most potent ministers and in their most unmitigable, unmitigable rage into a cloven pine within which rift in prison he did painfully remain. It's from Shakespeare, the Tempest, the spirit Ariel had been confined into a tree that the wizard Prospero releases and then enslaves, essentially. But the passage isn't talking about Calvin. It's talking about Mr. Murray. All right? Charles Wallace asks, Where are you, Mrs. Who? Where is Mrs. Witch? We cannot come to you now, Mrs. Who says. And she quotes Goethe, I do not know everything, still many things I understand. That's for you, Charles. Remember, you do not know everything. Charles Wallace thinks he knows everything, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He acts like he knows everything. She then says to Meg, to you I leave my glasses. Little blind as a bat. Don't use them except as a last resort. So, Mrs. What's it? Mrs. Witch finally says, here's what she leaves them with. Go down into the town into the town, go together, don't separate, stay together. Okay. Charles Wallace, I can take care of Meg. I always have. Because Mrs. What's it turns to Calvin and says, take care of Meg. Mrs. What's it looks at Charles. Charles Wallace, the danger here is greatest for you. Why? Because of what you are. Five-year-old boy, he's extremely smart. Just exactly because of what you are, you will be by far the most vulnerable. You must stay with Meg and Calvin. You must not go off on your own. Beware of pride and arrogance. Charles, for they may betray you. He says, okay, now, now, now I think I know what you mean about being afraid. Only a fool is not afraid. So they go down into the town and look at the description of the town. Page 115. Houses in the outskirts were all exactly alike. Small square boxes, painted gray. Each had a small rectangular plot of lawn in front. Straight line of dull looking flowers edging the path to the door. Meg had a feeling that if she could count the flowers, there would be the exact same number for each house. In front of all the houses, children are playing. Some are skipping ropes, some are bouncing balls. Meg felt something's wrong with their play. And Charles Wallace notices it. Those who are playing with bouncing balls are all bouncing the balls in rhythm simultaneously. So every ball that's bouncing, whether it's here, there, there, it's bouncing at the exact same time. Everybody that's jumping rope, the rope is moving and they're jumping also in time. The rope and ball are also hitting the ground at the same time. Exactly. Then all of the doors of the house open and women come out like a row of paper dolls. The print of their dresses was different, but they all gave the appearance of being the same. Each woman stood on the steps of her house. Each clapped. Each child with the ball caught the ball. Each child with the skipping rope folded the rope. Each child turned and walked into the houses. Doors clicked shut behind them. Meg, how can they do it? How do they do that? We couldn't do it that way if we tried. What does it mean? Calvin, let's go back. Why does Calvin not want to go on? He wants to leave this place and go 
shop. He wants to leave this place and go back up the hill. It's unnatural. It's unnatural. What did you say? It's sketchy. It's sketchy. Charles Wallace, back where? I, I don't know where, anywhere. Back to the hill, back to Mrs. Watson and Hood. I don't like this. But they aren't there. You think they'd come to us if we turn back now? Calvin, I don't like it. Come on, Meg says. You know we can't go back. Mrs. Witch said to go into the town. So they go in, and all at once they see the same thing. In front of one of the houses stood a little boy with a ball, bouncing it. Rather badly. That is, he's not bouncing it rhythmically. Sometimes dropping it, running after it. Dorvis house open, out ran one of the mother figures. She looks up and down the street. Saw the three children. Puts her hand to her mouth. Rushes to the little boy. Brings him inside with the ball rolling into the street. Charles Wallace, let's take it into him, see what, he see what happens. Meg, Mrs. Watson said for us to go into town. Well, we are in the town, aren't we? You, you two go on, if you don't want to come with me. Calvin, no, we're staying together. All right? Meg says, come on, Charles Wallace, don't you want to find Father? He says, yes, but not blindly. How can we help him if we don't know what we're up against? It's obvious we've been brought here to help him, not just to find him. So they go up. Charles Wallace rings the doorbell. After a moment, the mother figure opens the door. What do you want? It isn't paper time yet. We've had milk time. We've had this month's Puller Brush person, Fuller Brush person, 1950s. I've given my decency donations regularly. All my papers are in order. What's she doing? She's freaking out. Okay, but why? She feels like she's like being targeted. She's going down a list of things that she's already done. That is, regular things in her daily schedule. Why? The doorbell's not supposed to ring at this time. There aren't supposed to be three people outside her door. I think your little boy dropped this ball, Charles said. Oh, no, the children in our section never drop balls. They're all perfectly trained. We haven't had an aberration for three years. In other words, couldn't have been my kid. Go away. My kid wouldn't be an aberration. He sees the boy. You can't come in. You haven't shown me any papers. He holds the ball out. The boy leaps forward, grabs it. Charles Wallace, what are they afraid of? What's the matter with them? Meg, don't you know? Does Meg say, don't you know, because she does? No. Nope. No. She's hoping Charles Wallace knows. So what is it they're all afraid of? Being unknown. What characterizes... If nothing else, at least this street on Camazons. Her differences looked frowned or is frowned upon. Difference is frowned upon. This is the quintessence of conformity. Everybody the same. Everybody doing the same. Acting the same. Behaving the same. Charles, nope, not even close. So they keep walking in. They go up to a big door or another place, and they see a boy. The boy says, are you examiners? No. Charles Wallace asks, what are you quoting from? The manual, of course, page 121. We are the most oriented city on the planet. We are the most oriented city on the planet. What does it mean to orient something? To be the same. No. Kind of. It means to... To it means to adjust. It means to put it in its proper place. Literally, it means to turn it towards the east. The orient. So when you orient something, you're turning it towards the east. What he's saying is, we are the most properly adjusted city. We are, everything is perfect here. Nothing out of place or out of order. Does it also happen to be in the easternmost part of the White Pond? That we don't know. There has been no trouble of any kind for centuries. All Camelzots knows our record. This, that is why we are the capital city of Camelzots. That is why Central Central Intelligence is located here. That is why it makes its home here. Where is this Central Intelligence? Central Central 
notice. Okay. So they go off to central central intelligence. Um, tell you what, we will pick up today's Tuesday, right? We'll pick up on Thursday with chapter seven, the man with red eyes. And we'll have a quiz on Thursday. Over the whole thing? Yeah. And probably next week we'll have a quiz over, uh, two quizzes over the second book.